Sophia uh, Sulaki is a Greek convert uh, to Islam. And again, the, the title of the event is Why Do People Leave Islam? So we have uh, her really uh, giving that sort of the progressive side of Islam viewpoint today. She's a university lecturer of Islamic studies and a PhD researcher of progressive and feminist Islam. Her public engagement consists uh, primarily of her YouTube channel, uh, where she creates uh, videos, first of all, in Greek uh, for her background and for her Greek audience with English subtitles, and that covers both uh, Quranic study and exegesis, as well as also breaking down the basic elements of Islam for Greeks um, to counter Islamophobia uh, among the Greek community. And again, those are also English subtitled. And can I just say, as a fan of the YouTube channel, as a recent fan of the YouTube channel, uh, your voice is also very, very soothing oh, as well. You. So uh, I'd like to inv invite you back in a year's time. And in the bio, I'm sure there will be audiobook extraordinaire. So please do get that going. It's a very, very soothing voice. Your critique is very cutting, but also this, the voice is very soothing as well. Uh, and uh, as well as the, the videos in Greek, Sophia also has videos in English, uh, where she addresses distortions in the West of Islamic values and uh, um, unfair practices by Muslims in engaging with the rest of the world. And our other speaker, uh, we're very honored to have Imtiaz join us. Uh, now Imtiaz, uh, as well as being a, a passionate tech entrepreneur uh, in one life, in another life serving uh, the ex community and also the apostate community, he's a human rights activist and he's a co-founder of Faith to Faithless, which like young humanists, uh, where I hail from, is also a section of Humanist UK. And CLH, uh, the Central and Humanist, is a, is a partner group of Humanist UK. And Humanist UK is the major national uh, charity representing humanists in the UK. Uh, so he's an apostate, uh, apostasy support advocate, and especially regarding high control religious uh, societies and, and families. Uh, and definitely, uh, I think the idea of uh, practical apostate support is very important, as well as the sort of campaigning support as well. And that was founded in 2012, and MTS has called upon his own apostasy experiences to help build Faith to Faithless. And he's appeared uh, everywhere, sort of BBC Online, on broadcast TV, on discussion shows, as well as also debate shows, The Guardian, The Times, and Vice. Uh, and in 2017, as a highlight, he was the first ex-Muslim Again, a building on the interfaith and intergroup cooperation and dialogue theme, he was the first ex-Muslim to speak at a Muslim conference, uh, which is important to have that, uh, that dialogue, which we're continuing again today. Okay, uh, now that I've introduced both the speakers, I'm going to hand over to them. Thank you very much. I'm so excited to have you here. <laughs> Just as a bit of a, a history to this event, so, um, I've been thinking for a long time about doing something a little bit meatier and a bit uh, kinder than the debate format that you have, but without being another interfaith thing where everyone's patting each other on the back and it's you never get to the meat of anything. I'm very, very lucky to have found Sophia, I think, because, because um, as AJ said, the soothing voice is very cutting. And I think, I think that's really important. We need to be able to kind of not walk around some of these topics and really have a proper discussion. Uh, as AJ mentioned, uh, about 2015, uh, this uh, uh, Dilwar Hussein's group, I can't remember the name, invited me to speak at one of the conferences, the British Islam Conference. Um, that was complicated, I think, for them, but they did it. And it was such an amazing little, little panel we had. That, taught me a little bit of like what kind of event I like. And I think when I was actually asked to do this really by myself and I thought, no, 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 no. We, we've got to make this a little bit more of a discussion. Um, and, and really thank you to Central London Humans for putting this together. It was such a well-organized, I am Asian, we tend to be late with things actually run on time, very impressed. That's amazing and thank you for that. I think I want to start with stories. So yeah. rather, than, rather than like getting into it, I'd love to know a bit more of your story. We haven't talked too much because I, I thought we'll leave it. So why don't you start? You know, give us two, three minutes about your, minutes? your oh. journey. <laughs> you can do five. You can go five, and then I'll do the same, and then we'll we'll start maybe. Okay, that's that's a story that uh, people ask me in YouTube, and I never I never tell my story. Um, so it will be the first. That's really special. Uh, that's okay, it. my story is a bit um, different than the typical story of converts. So as as I grew up as a Christian, as an Orthodox uh, mm. uh, Christian, and I used to be exceptionally religious, taking mm. from my maternal uh, grandmother. Mm. But then when I when I enter the the age of you know rational thinking, there were things that were like oh that doesn't yeah. no, something doesn't go well. 
At the same time, the narration in Greece, the, our, our national identity, is being built upon the, um, I wouldn't say hatred, I would say uh, fear to Islam, because mm. we were created recently as a state, Greece, mm. Uh, out of Ottoman Empire. Mm. So the whole idea is that, oh, these bad Muslims, they were doing bad things mm. to us, and now eventually, you know, we need to have identity. And I remember an incident that happened with my grandmother. I was nine or 11 years old. So my grandmother and a, a neighbor lady were sitting in the, um, you know, in the, on the porch, and summer heat, we were eating watermelon, and we see um, a a foreigner walking in front of the street. So my grandmother very casually turns to the other um, elderly lady and she's like, you know, he's a Muslim and they have a plan one night that we will all be sleeping. They will all together wake up and slit our throats. Oh, no. <laughs> but this was this was very casual. And guys, my grandma was a sweet, sweet, super sweet nice Greek creature. Lady. <laughs> yeah. So the other lady was like, yeah, I know. You see times that we live. But as a child, I got terrified. So then I remember myself, whenever I had to walk in the, in the village and I would see someone that looked for Einer, in my head was like, Muslim will kill me. Mm -hmm. So then fast forward, I'm 23, 24 years old, not sure about my faith system. I have, had left consciously Christianity and I was still searching about. And then I meet a person, he used to be my colleague and he was very kind, very helping, very sweet person. And at some point I asked him about his... Uh, um, Christianing, or let's say how he got his name. Mm -hmm. And he was like, no, I'm not, I'm not baptized. We are not getting baptized. And I said, we, who is we? And he's like, Muslims. And I got shocked, the second shock. I was like, you can't be, you can't be Muslim, you're kind. You <laughs> how yeah, can you be Muslim? Yeah, so since then, I started trying to learn. Now there were obstacles. One, in Greece, we don't have enough material to read and learn about mm -hmm. Islam. And back then I didn't speak English. Mm -hmm. Internet was a new thing. And in Greece, we had only one person who was advocating Islam. Later, I realized that this person is Salafi. But back then, to me, ah. Salafi meant nothing. I had no idea what is it. So the, the idea of Islam that he was presenting was that I had to wear black. I had to stay home and just make babies. You know, all these. And I was like, ah, I can't, I can't do that. <laughs> so, what would my grandma say? <laughs> so, yeah. So... Again, fast forward, I, I migrated here uh, 10 years ago, exactly 10 years ago, and I started studying here. So I went to uni, and in my master's, I took a module that the title is, is still running, um, Modern Trends in Islam. And this module made me understand that, you know what? Islam has two main sects, and then each sect has bisects, and there are so different narrations, and, and you know, the Quran and everything. And only when I realized that, you know what, trying to learn Islam through Muslims is not the way, mm. then I felt confident that after the completion of my master's, mm. that yes, I can serve in this religion mm. and I can be happy in it mm. by being myself without mm. having to sacrifice my character. Mm. It's a really interesting story. Thank you. I told you more than three minutes. <laughs> it's really interesting when you mentioned the story with your grandma, because I have a very, very similar story with the kuffar, you know, ah, oh, yeah, the infidel, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? Like uh, seeing this otherization of a group, which in the case of, in my upbringing, it's everyone who's not Muslim. Um, although it's done in a strangely loving way. It's like, oh, they don't, they're just bad, but they can be made better. You know, let's bring them to Islam. Yeah, it's only always yeah. the idea that uh, yeah. they come back. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's quite interesting. And I, I think our group, in-group dynamics are so important when we talk about people who enter Islam and leave Islam and, mm. and that kind of movement. One of my background, I also don't really do much about my story. I've been doing this for a while, but I tend not to like to talk about it. But um, uh, yeah, background wise, I grew up, I'm British, I was born in the UK, but uh, I spent 10 years in Saudi Arabia, the uh, liberal bastion of the world. It's, mm. it's, doing, it's doing quite well. And I always say that growing up then after Saudi Arabia in East London was more religious than in Saudi Arabia. Right, and I, I would present. I think it's because Saudi Arabia is a theocracy. You're you're not fighting any big power. Who's the man? The man is the government. Here, you don't really have an identity so much. So everyone kind of co coalesced around this like Salafi identity, True. which uh, which is hilarious because actually the a lot of the immigrant communities here were Sufi. <laughs> like the Ubandis were like more Sufi or or things like that. So they weren't so Salafi back in the day, and then things change and Saudi money and all that. 
so grew up very religious, I think like yourself, it was a combination, like, sure, families involved, but a lot of the times you're trying to figure something out about your own inside, right? And, and that journey made me more religious, not less. But also like you, I think in some ways, I, I looked around to the Ummah, the, the community of Muslims, across every part that I could see, which you have a limited exposure to, and went, this can't be right. There's something off about this because it just doesn't mesh with what I think a su su superior for all of time, for all of mankind system should look like. And um, that like battle in my head didn't have a solution because no one can leave Islam. It's impossible. No one does who leaves Islam. That's not a thing. <laughs> 1.8 billion people, yeah. And I was like, I was like this is, and exactly, to think I'm arrogant enough to be the first person to, in the world to leave Islam because no one leaves Islam, made me think, what? And then thinking about people in my life, like your grandma's sweet, but she'll have these views. I have absolutely amazing family members, and then they'll say something, I'm like, oof, you know? And it's like, you don't, how do you make yourself think, how can I think I'm better than them? You know? And that's a really tough thing. For, it was a really tough thing for me. I think really quickly I realized, wait a minute, people do leave Islam, it's just they're not public about it. And internet was an amazing thing at the time. I think the internet, I imagine for you as well, if you yeah, said there's internet. one, there was yes. one, and I'd probably like to bring this up later, um, so Reddit was where I sort of started off. Um, my, my Reddit username was in propaganda. It still is now eight years ago, 10 years ago. And uh, you know, it was just went into first seeing, oh wait, there's other people. Ah, but you guys are a little bit angry. I didn't like that. that at the time I was like, oh, I and then I started going, ah, oh, but who wants to meet me? And everyone was like, you want to meet people in public? I remember the first time I met someone was, I took my friend who was a non-Muslim from university and I said, hey, can you sit in the Starbucks where I'm supposed to meet him? and just tell me if he looks dodgy. And she was like, eh, he looks like a normal Asian kid. And so I met this kid and I don't know who this kid is anymore. Uh, like I met him, he was, he came out to me as ex-Muslim and bisexual at the same time. And I've, I don't know, I don't remember who this person is anymore. Like I've lost that person I first came out to. After that, it was like being on a, in an addiction. I just kept meeting people over and over again. We set up groups. That's kind of how some of the ex-Muslim stuff started and Faith to Faith just became me meeting other people who'd left other religions and going, wait a minute, your mom problems and my mom problems are exactly the same, you know? Your mom's lovely, but is like really controlling. Our, your theological inclination and your issues were this, and it's very similar to me. And you started realizing this was a bigger thing than just, than just kind of leaving Islam is a lot bigger than that. So that's my background. I'm gonna start straight into it. Why do you think people leave Islam? Because they perceive Islam or they understand Islam through Muslims. Uh -huh. And this is a massive mistake. It happened, I mean, it took me 16 years to decide to convert. But in these 16 years, I started meeting through internet people from different parts of the world. And their stories wouldn't add. And they were all of them Muslims. And another issue is that I would observe that their preaching and their actions didn't match. It was like hypocrisy. A lot. And yeah. I say that with a bit of pain because I really care about these people. Some of yeah, them, they're yeah. still my friends. Yeah, yeah. And it's sad, but it happens. And then when you try to tell them that, you know why? You are a good person. The reason that you cannot meet the expectations that you preach is not because you're not good enough. It's because these are unrealistic, inhumane. Mm. So knowing Islam or trying to understand Islam through Muslims, big no, no. It's quite interesting because... Um, and, I, and I just want to make something really clear that I, I find that there's a difference between kind of experiential stuff and academic stuff. So just to be clear, I'm not coming into this with a strong academic background. I don't have that, um, which, he do, which, he does, <laughs> which he does, but there has been academic work on why people leave Islam. So I can, I can draw a little bit on that. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting because... And it, also, if I put a room of 30 ex-Muslims in front of you, you'll find that a lot of them will not point to Muslims so much because it's a very easy thing for us to say, ah, they're doing this. Because the reason we, I stayed in faith was because Muslims are all doing this, but Islam has to be true and clean. And actually I stayed away from, and this is a story of a lot of ex-Muslims, I stayed away from Muslims as much as possible because I realized that they weren't practicing Islam properly. Mm -hmm. it, it, it ended up being more like the, foundational like epistemological beliefs, it was like the morality, it was like the, you know, how LGBTs dealt with within Islamic framework for me. And mm -hmm. it's something I've seen a lot, mm -hmm. but I will say often when, I think often 
born Muslims do think, oh, it's because you're surrounded by Muslims who don't practice it properly? Not that they don't, they don't practice properly. This is another, uh, yeah. uh, you know, chapter. It, it is about, you see, you mentioned internet. We are lucky enough, we are blessed to be able to, when someone will tell us something about Islam, we can go and search and, and you know, yeah. confirm. Or, but imagine people that they are today, today in their 60s. They didn't have that luxury. So whatever your local imam would tell you, you would take mm -hmm. it. And the imam is authority, you mm -hmm. like it or not. Mm -hmm. And then if you're someone that your heart, your soul doesn't Actually, feel comfortable, yeah. the logical conclusion would be, I'm wrong. Yeah. Okay, so I don't mean it the way they practice it. Mm -hmm. Each one practices different, mm -hmm. differently. But I talk about what do you think Islam to be, and between me and you, mm -hmm. not everyone has the capacity or the, the the inclination to start all the Quran and then start all the Tafsir to find the values. You know, it it, it doesn't happen. Do you need to be an academic to understand Islam? No, reading the Quran is, has nothing to do with academia. And theoretically, one of the things that I like in Islam, comparing to Christianity. Mm -hmm is that the Qur'an is for every single one of us. And we are supposed to read it. How many children are being sent to schools to memorize the Qur'an? And all what they memorize is the sounds. Yeah. The idea was not the sounds. The idea was that every single Muslim will be in direct contact with the divine through the Qur'an. And you don't have to be academic to Ooh, do that. I have a really interesting angle for this on colonialism. <laughs> but maybe we'll take that five seconds later. I don't want to get a bit distracted from what you were saying earlier about okay learning through the tools that you have uh, within the Islamic faith. But isn't that what all the religions say? So I'll, I'll give you an example. If you look at Christianity, they don't have the Bible maybe in the same way the Quran does. Like the Quran is like, oh, this is the word of God. It's exactly immutable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Bible has a slightly yeah, different. Like yeah, yeah, slightly yeah, different. Yeah, yeah. Um, but there are different structures within Christianity that allow people to say, ah, but Christians are not practicing Christianity properly. The real Christianity is what's right. And then I can go to the Judaism. Uh, Judaism is a little bit more complicated. You get similar things in Hasidic and kind of, uh, you know, uh, yes. uh, is this not just what religions do in order to keep people in? They say, the th theology is great. It's the people that are wrong. But people, if, if you believe people made it, <laughs> like, of course. But I'll tell you wrong. something. It depends on how do you define religion. Yeah, Depends how do you, on how do you, how define, do you, religion? How do you define religion. Because if we talk about this authoritative structure that uh, is an organization at the mm. end of the day, mm. that wants more and more people in, like have many babies because we want more of us, yeah. and don't get married outside our, 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 our faith because we want more of us. I'm out of that. I don't mean that. Okay. What I mean when I say religion means your, your soul's desire, if at all, mm -hmm. to be connected to a higher of um, energy, authority, power, whatever you want to call it. I mean, the divine. Because that could be deist or that could be Gnostic. Like, mm -hmm, what is mm -hmm. it about Islam? Mm -hmm. This is going slightly off topic, but for you personally. For me personally. <laughs> what, what do you think draws you to Islam specifically, not to like a more spiritual concept of God? I'll tell you. Oh, first of all, I, f I have very intense spiritual mm -hmm. uh, understanding of, of the divine. But for me, as someone that I... I, I I was old enough. I, I, I was a mother by that time. I had migrated countries. I had raised my children. So I had enough life experience. So when I read the Quran and I saw the directions and, and commands, they, they resonate with me. So for example, uh, okay, I will not go into details. It's not the time, but the, the, not the punishments, but the uh, prohibitions, mm. they made sense to me because many events in my life had shown me that committing this act mm. resulted in something that hurt me. Mm. So I'm like, okay, so this is the only, because I told you I was searching for my, mm. you know, religion. Yeah, I understand that. Uh, it was the only one that was like, that's me. That, I mean, I don't have to change, that, that's me. And I have now something that gives to mm. my understanding and authority and, you know, validates it. This is why I love having these kind of conversations, because I, I've, I've had a lot of conversations with people who converted to Islam and then left, and also people who are still converted to Islam. And I tend to have the most interesting conversation with converts because there's so much, so many echoes. The same thing you just said that, you know, you were searching for something and the prohibitions kind of made sense, you know, yes. with your experience. I will say for me and for a lot of ex-Muslims, it's the exact same thing the other yeah, way around. Uh, yes. Because life experience teaches you that some of the prohibitions in Islam don't make sense. For example, uh, you know, you speak to a lot of women who wear a hijab, it doesn't protect them. It, you know, if it's the sense of modesty, it doesn't necessarily fit in son, with that. Son, son, you know what is the problem? 
bring me the Quranic verse okay. that tells us that we have to wear the hijab. And don't get, because I'm wearing the hijab and I have a huge issue, I have to justify it both to those who are against it and those who so are for it, yeah. forward. Yeah, yeah. There is no such ruling in the Quran. Mm. It's a man-made, a medieval, scho medieval scholars, male scholars, mm. decided that for us. God has not told us, it's not a, you know, it's not a requirement. Hmm. It's, it's a, not it's a, a sin. Now, the way I wear it, I wear it because I like myself with it, okay? Yeah, I'm but, not even going to the person, yeah, yeah. This is the point, you see, you, you brought it as an example of what Islam says. Which Islam says that? The medieval scholars of Islam? That we have been fed the idea that they are, you know, infallible and whatever they said, hmm. it's the law? Or the Quran? Because the Quran doesn't say anything about it, that. And it, it depends on whether you believe the Quran is the only source of, because that's a very non-traditional, well, as in. Do I look traditionalist yeah, to you? Yeah, yeah, it's true. As in, <laughs> as in because uh, just a little bit of education piece for people. Uh, traditionally speaking, Muslims will believe the Quran is the word of God, immutable. And there's something like hadith, which are like the collections of sayings of the, of, 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 of the prophet and actions and things like that. And there's, there's supposed to be like a science of the chain of narration all the way down to the point where some hadith are considered equitable to Quran in terms of like strength, so mutawatir hadith and things like that. Mm. But hadith is a very, it's, and I often with ex-Muslims, hadith is where people go, oh no, because the Quran, but I would argue the Quran is a little bit more abstract. That's probably why, because where it's not abstract, for example, the story of the, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, like loot and things like that, like when there's stories of violence or stories of like, 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 for example, uh, who I'm, I'm going to talk about is, you know that? Talk, talk, talk. Who is, who is that? What was that story about the, um, is it Khidr? Uh, you know, with, the, with the, the, the three lessons and then he kills the uh, yes, 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 yes. Those yes, stories yes. are in the Quran. Now, they are. the explanatory aspects of them tend to come in from, like, explanations of the Quran. But they're there. And they're kind of weird. <laughs> you see, I held myself. So, yeah. specifically about could you, the story. Could you just tell people a little bit about the story as well, so that... About the, the three things. Yeah, okay, yeah. so uh, the, the whole idea is that Abraham uh, um, um, is, is, needs to follow um, an, a stranger, practically. That, but the, the, the rules are that you follow him, but you don't ask questions. So the first uh, thing is that he, they take a boat and uh, then in the middle of the river or something, they destroy the boat. And then um, Abraham was like, are you, are you destroying the boat? Well, I mean, this man gave it to you. Mm -hmm. And the guy was like, I told you not to ask questions. And then the second thing was with a baby, a young, a young child. So this man uh, kills the child. And then Abraham is, is horrified. He's like, what are you doing? He's like, didn't I tell you not to ask questions? He says, okay, forgive me. And the third thing um, is that they find, they, they go to a village and the villagers send them away. And then as they move away from the village, the stranger, the stranger man um, finds a wall that is half destroyed and builds again the wall. And then Abraham is like, I, why, why are you doing that? So at this point, this figure decides to explain why. So he explained that the wall had inside coins, golden coins, and the boys that were to inherit the wall were you know, still young. So he fixed the wall so when the boys will grow up, will take the, the coins. And when it comes to the boy, he was supposed when he grow up to be a horrible creature and cause pain to the parents. So he killed the child to... The, the pain of killing the child would be less for the parents and then the parents will have another child and this will save them for greatest pain. And then the boat, the boat, I think a, a king was supposed to come and take the boat yeah, and take the sons as well. Yeah, yeah, piracy. So the idea was that I caused the less evil now to save them for a greater evil later on. But this is, I mean, to me, this is more of like a story, a moral, which, okay, if you see life, realities of life, sometimes, the, you know, you take the painful decision now, knowing that this will help you in the but, future. But for example, the, the middle one, the child. Yeah. If I might, I just want to, uh, I, I don't have it, the passage for me, but my understanding was it was the child was going to be a non-believer. In traditional, in tr traditional tafsir. Uh, traditional tafsir is a different business. And let me t tell you about traditional tafsir, because uh, personally, I question many of this uh, tafsir, sure. but I do recognize that people back then had limited, because today we talk about, no about knowledge, but I can read all these books within one year. Mm. When we say that the scholars of the past, they were reading books, if you have seen booklets back then, it was 15 pages each, mm. and they would read how many in their lifetime? 20, 30, 50. So their knowledge was limited. And also when you said about the story of Lot, one thing that Muslims 
I don't know if they do it intentionally or they never thought about it, is that in our religion, the idea is that the Quran came as a correction for um, New Testament and Old Testament, the Torah, okay? Now, if you are in the school and I publish a book, or in academia, I publish a book, and then I make corrections. Don't you need to read the first book? Don't you need to understand the first book? So they go to read the Quran directly, that it's exceptionally abstract. But they don't bother themselves to read the Bible. In the Quran, the, the biblical stories are mentioned like that. It's, it's just a, a very short... Uh, it's much more detailed. Because the idea is that Muslims will bother themselves to read the, the Bible. As an ex-Christian, when I read the, the Quran, many things made sense to me naturally because I knew the biblical yeah, story. Yeah. So one thing that was quite interesting for me, because I think a lot of born Muslims, I agree, are not educated really about history beyond Islamic traditional history. You know, like the history that we have theologically almost. What history? They don't know history. Right. This is exactly they know the whatever their mother but, but, and their imam told them. But I mean, the more I looked at, for me personally, the more I looked beyond that in the Middle East hub of religion, the kind of cradle of a lot of these civilization, and look further back there, so like uh, Aramaic, uh, Sasanian, mm -hmm, etc. Mm -hmm. And also you go far further out, and then you've got completely different forms of religion. Mm -hmm. A lot of these, let's call them weird stories, make sense. Because a lot of them have roots in, let's say, uh, you know, Aramaic... Uh, like even the, a lot of the laws within the Quran, which are not in Hadith, or like they're in Hadith, but let's just ignore Hadith in Quran. You can draw equivalences further, 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 further back, which makes sense because that area had a lot of movement of faith at the time, right? Yes. When Muslims are told that Islam is the final religion mm -hmm. and the Quran is the, is the book of God's word, that makes more sense if you take it within its context in history and as if it was made by people of the time than if you take it as if it's applicable today. That's often the conclusion that a lot of ex-Muslims, I think, come up to. Um, mm. And this is kind of coming back to this idea that it's not because Muslims are bad that a lot of ex-Muslims leave, I find. It's often because you learn more about where the theology might come from and how it fits with other concepts. Like humanism is a good example. Like, we've got books here. None of these books will agree with each other, and that's okay. That's accepted yeah. within sort of humanist thought. This, Islam is a lot more fluid, I would agree, than people think, but it does have the Quran as the fixed point of mm -hmm. information. A fixed, there is a big question on being fixed because the Quran, you know, every text, like every painting, if all of us we will look at the same painting, each one of us will take a different meaning from it and a different, mm. you know, understanding. So the Quran is like that. It, the, the, the values and the principles of Quran are specific, but everything else depends on the interpretation that the reader gives it. And this, is, this takes us back to what I mentioned at the beginning, that the whole idea of Islam is that each one of us will read the Quran. And one, one practice that some of us practice is that if I read the Quran this year and then I read it again after 10 years, I will discover new meanings and I will discover new understandings because they will resonate with my 50-year-old Sophia, not with my 40-year-old Sophia. I'm going to sort of try to bring it towards this uh, question around, you know, why people leave Islam and extend it out further. You know, we've got change in this panel. Like, we've got leaving, you know, Christi traditional Christianity, Orthodox Christianity, becoming Muslim, and in my case, leaving Islam. Let's talk a little bit about change. Just personally speaking, mm. what was challenging for you in your journey into Islam? Mm -hmm. I mean, did your family, what, were your, what did your family think? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Are you still in conversation? It's all fine? Well, uh, my story is a bit... Uh, if you don't mind mm, me, not, I don't know. Not, I mean, that. yeah. So my fa I consider my family to be my daughters and my younger sister that they live with me. Got it. So both, uh, not both, all three ladies, they are super supportive. They are not Muslims. Yeah. But they they keep an eye on me. So in yeah. Ramadan, it's like, are you going to eat? Is Ramadan? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, 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 I'm not eating, I'm not eating. No. <laughs> Some of them are not alive, yeah. part of my family. Um, my grandmother was not alive when I converted. Mm. Good for her. Mm. Uh, uh, and some others I just don't have good relations. Sure, sure, sure. So I didn't have. I had a lot of uh, pressure from my friends and you know uh, friendships back and in, in Greece, Greece yeah. and the Greek community here. Uh, uh, big pressure. Are big they more pressure. conservative here or are they more conservative in Greece? 
would you say? Same. Same. Same thing. The whole idea that I, I, I entered Islam was that I betray. You know, they couldn't understand that this is a spiritual thing. For them, it was also a nationalistic thing. It was yeah. like, you're care. a traitor. Yeah. Uh, why did you do that? Why yeah. you betrayed your nation? Same, same with us. And I'm like, what nation, man? <laughs> it's, it's same with the ex-Muslims. With, with, with us, if we leave Islam, it's like, there's so much Islamophobia in the world. You left and somehow now you're white. And you fuel. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah somehow yeah, I've yeah, become yeah. white now. Okay, cool. Did you meet any people who left Islam in your journey in? Do you remember when I mentioned the first person I yes, met that yes, he was Muslim? Yes, yes. God wanted it that now I'm Muslim and he's Christian. He eventually converted <laughs> Christianity. That's really funny. And not only he converted, uh, his right. name is Rami, if you are watching this. Yeah. Uh, uh, he, he cut off when I decided that I want to convert. For he some, cut he cut off from me. Okay, <laughs> when Rami. I decided. Okay, Rami. So yes, I know, I know. And I know, I know people, um, I know another person from Iran that Rami. they abandoned Islam. Ah. Ah. So I do know people that they, they have left um, Islam. Yeah. It's, it, you know, when, I, when I've spoken to, to a lot of converts who've left Islam, I know one thing that um, they often say is they wish they knew certain things. Uh, and in, I think in your case it's different because you're clearly deep into like theology. And, and I think that's, that's, not, that's actually very common. Converts really go deep into theology, I find. Because, you um, know, you, you change your... You know, it's a commitment. Yeah, Islam is yeah, a commitment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because Christianity, at least the way we practice it in my country, mm. uh, usually we remember it every Easter and every Christmas, right, right, and that's right, right, it. Right. But Islam, Whereas you gotta, Islam, it's, it's commitment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm like, yeah. can I do that? Yeah, yeah. Do I want to do that? Yeah. So it needs to resonate and, and you yeah, know, otherwise sure. you lose your, um, your, your fire. And um, talking about this concept of change, so... Let's talk a little bit about what could be good. So the fact that we're having this conversation, if you looked at it 10 years ago, honestly, like there was not that many people like ex-Muslims like myself who were like really public. You had a couple of activist type people. I think even today, a lot of Muslims, whether they've converted or they're born, are afraid of having this conversation, right? Like, and I think it's silly because I don't bite, you don't bite, it's all nice. Um, but what do you think can change? So, because we can agree both like theological debates aside, it's not okay what happens to people when they enter Islam, I'm sure, and also when they leave Islam. Yeah. So what do you think, with your experience in, the, in different Muslim communities and also with knowledge of theology in the mm -hmm. way you have, mm -hmm. could change? And how would you educate Muslim people to make them more accepting of ex-Muslims in their family, their children, their moms, their dads? I'll tell you, this will take time mm -hmm. because religion is an intrinsic part of a person's identity. And many Muslims of older than 40 years old, let's put it that way, that didn't have the social media, they grew up within, within boxes, that this is what my community's imams say, this is what my, uh, my family practices, that's what I will do. And even themselves, they had at some point to sacrifice their, their soul's, you know, call, in aim to fit. Mm. These people will have great difficulty to accept it because that's who they are, it's in their blood. Mm -hmm. When it comes to younger generations, that is a different uh, story because, first of all, we have much more people talking openly about this idea that uh, apostasy, as we understand it in Islam, mm -hmm. it, it's not in the Quran, it was not practiced by the Prophet. Everything started after the Prophet's death. Mm -hmm. So, and it was political mm -hmm. because Islam, being Muslim back then, was political. Yeah. And also back then there were how many? 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 people altogether? Not many. The best so, people though, apparently. Let's not talk about that. <laughs> but theoretically, they needed to the keep people... The reason that's funny for people who don't come from a Muslim background is the, the Sahaba, the companions, and the Tabi'in, the companions after them, are, are deified a bit. But some of them did some slightly weird things, which we don't slightly? talk about. Yeah. <laughs> really weird watch, things. Watch my YouTube videos. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, no, the idea is that uh, younger people are exposed into different opinions. Mm. And they know, uh, this is something I know experientially because I do, I carry out my interviews for my PhD currently. It's fantastically how the younger people, one, one younger person told me, I've never known Islam without internet. Yeah. And they learn through internet and they are exposed to different opinion. A person who is today 60 years old was never exposed mm. to a different idea. And the moment that this exposure happened, it's a shock. Mm. So we need to wait a bit and we need to be more vocal. Mm. And we need to, you know, put, put the human face on people that decided to leave yeah, the I faith. Yeah, I completely agree. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And th this is the kind of probably the most important thing. I think I would add also normalization. So 
uh, not just human face. Like one thing I do is I go to as many weddings in my community as I can because I want to be there. I like weddings anyways, there's lots of food, Asian weddings. Yeah, exactly, food. food. <laughs> but you know, I have earrings, which is not really traditional in my community. I'm, people know I'm ex-Muslim, I would say a decent percentage of people. And just being there rather than the brain drain we get when people are LGBT or you know, maybe they've married a black guy, God forbid, you know, in the Asian community, or, 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 or you've left Islam, you never see them again. It's brushed under the carpet, you know? Yeah. And I think it's, it is, I completely agree with you, just exposure being there, is exposure. Important. And, and the, and the YouTube, you know, social media is double-edged, though, because you talk about these young people who are exposed to different ideas on the internet, and I completely agree with you. And this is why you get people, you know, there'll be girls who wear hijab, and they're, you know, they have many traditional views. They'll watch anime and be very, very LGBT friendly, you know, mm, or they'll be mm, like, I'm pansexual mm. and I'm wearing hijab. And I, I, I've always been a fan of that. I think sometimes ex-Muslims are a little bit, um, it's funny, ex-Muslims sometimes don't like that stuff in progressivism and, and reform because they say, ah, oh, but it's not real Islam. And I'm like, first of all, academically speaking, there's no such thing as a real Islam yeah, anyways. Yeah. And second of all, if you as an atheist or humanist, etc., believe Islam is made by people, it can change because people made it. So it's, it's you know, it doesn't make sense to me. But I do... Th I do think you also get extremism on the other side. And we've seen the same thing. The internet has been terrible for extremism. Yes, but again, from my, I shouldn't talk about my research because I haven't published yet. But you know what is a, 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 an element of my research that really I didn't expect? Tradition, uh, people with very Salafi ideas. Mm. Salafi, Salafism is, is, is the most extreme, you know, very uh, strict version of Islam. They knew about feminist Islam and they, they were talking yeah. about progressive yeah, yeah, Islam yeah. to badmouth it, of yeah, course, yeah, yeah. but, they, but they still it, it was yeah. there. Yeah, I agree. So yeah. even, even when yeah. these, you know, uh, um, these, these, these backward, let's say, yeah, ideas yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, are there, or these communities, these people, they are exposed. Yeah, I, I, to the I agree. I agree. And I think this is kind of new. Like, it's interesting. Sometimes you find online these, these communities are more comfortable with the concept of an ex-Muslim than someone who's a Quran-only Muslim, for example, who don't follow, follow the hadith. They're like, oh, at least the ex-Muslims just leave it. You guys are corrupting, the, you know, which is the worst thing, you know, corrupting the faith. Do you know why? Because to deal with an ex-Muslim from this perspective mm. is very easy. It's like, oh, he's a kafir, he's unbeliever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But when you are in the faith yeah. and you talk about yeah. the distortions of the faith, yeah. they, you know, you're the most they they you're quite a dangerous person yes. because, yeah, no, I completely agree. You see, you ask me about difficulties and you consider difficulties from my Christian community to come into Islam. The greatest difficulties and the greatest, uh, let's say, uh, attacks, I receive them from Muslims. Yeah, I believe that. Yeah, yeah, I believe that. And. Have you found any of them have changed their minds on you just in time? Like someone who was really aggressive before and actually over time they, they grew to respect you? God forgive me for what I will say, but because majority of these people are males, right. they quite, I mean, I had one that he actually threatened me and I had my friends in Facebook telling me, come to my house for a while, you know, stuff like that. After a month, of me just maintaining a nice and calm. Mm -hmm. He just asked me to meet him downtown for coffee. <laughs> oh, really? But the idea is... He'll bring you to the right path. Yes. The concept. Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, no. We're going to get to questions very soon now, I think. This has been quite interesting. Um, is there something you want to bring up, just out of curiosity on why people leave Islam? No, not really, but I want to ask you something yeah, sure. because, and again, it will be from my own eyes. Yeah, and yeah. this is always when people yeah. talk, Muslims make talk, it it's, it's, it's from, it's... no, it's not, difficult. I don't want to make you feel difficult, oh, you know, uncomfortable, but uh, uh, no, I will do that in the food. I will do that <laughs> in the, uh, the point is that, so is your soul happy now that yeah. you are out of Islam? I'm glad you asked that specific question and not, are you happy? Why is it <laughs> <laughs> I, I would say absolutely. So, you know, one thing is, uh, and this is something I've asked a lot of ex-Muslims, uh -huh. would you take it back? You know, would you, and almost consistently people say, as much as this has been painful, I've lost my family or, you know, da da da, it's the best thing I did. And for me, this is how I feel because leaving Islam doesn't mean I'm not close to Islam. I'm actually slightly obsessed with Islamic like history and theology <laughs> and also like wider than Islamic theology, like pre-Islamic as well. Like I used to go to SOAS and just sit when I was working in the lectures in the Center for Islamic Studies. It's so fascinating, you know, it's, it's, and it's unfortunately my heritage. I don't have any other cultural heritage because that's kind of what we grew up in. Yes, you know, we, we yes, and this yes. is without getting too much into the colonial aspect, like, you know, we have a 
the language of Arabic. It's supposed to be spoken by people who are mostly non-Arabs now. And, uh, and you know, it was, it was spread through both peace and war. And, and there's a lot of history of how that was used to subjugate and things like that. And, and for me, as someone who grows up also in Britain, where we're very openly talking about, oh, yeah, yeah we're Bangladeshis. We're brought here to clean toilets. Like, we don't respect the British Empire so much. Well, the family is, yeah. <laughs> Uh, the Bangladeshis were actually historically, but or do textiles, but in the Islamic context, often it's used like in a, in, especially in academia, some aspects of it like, as a decolonizing force almost. It's mm-hmm. really interesting, which is not actually factually true at all. Mm-hmm. So that, you know that's been quite an interesting journey for me. I would say I'm really really happy with that decision, but it's almost irrelevant to me now because <gasps> it's like the world is so big. Your soul is irrelevant to you. No no no, as in, as in leaving Islam made my soul bigger. Like, mm. I have so much more I can absorb. Mm. Uh, you know, I, I would consider myself a humanist, so everything I read is wrong, in a way, and you can only get closer to the truth through constant action. There's no truth, if that makes sense. Mm. And that's, that's really exciting for me, because then I can constantly learn yes. from me. Yes, you can um, yes. I, I think there is a lot of challenges around the fact that the way it's structured today with, with Muslims, because that makes leaving Islam almost impossible, you're always going to face trauma. There's not a single ex-Muslim on the planet I've met who hasn't got some deep set trauma. And that's not okay. You know, that we need to get past that. But, but yeah, no, I would say I'm, I'm, I'm pretty happy with leaving Islam for sure. Good. What was most difficult and scary for me was family. You know, can I people, yeah. deal with that? And that's, that's why people often leave a double life. So actually, this was one of my questions. So, you know, where, where when people leave Islam, so many of them do it in secret. Um, yes, yes, yes. And... You know, they live double lives. And, and what, what do you think What do you think needs to change for that? I mean, I think some of it is like the faith. Would you recommend someone to leave Islam publicly, for example? I would first ask them what they feel comfortable with. Because if we say to everyone, do it publicly, if they don't have the stamina yeah. and the, the strength, the mental strength, we will just harm them. Yeah. So it is totally up to each individual. If they feel that the pain is less by having double life, do whatever makes your heart happy. If you have the stamina, so personally, as a person, I'm, I'm very tough person, mm. very tough mm-hmm. individual. Yeah. So when I, I, I don't give, I, I, I don't apologize and I don't explain to anyone, mm-hmm. Muslims or non-Muslims. Yeah, sure. So someone like me, publicly. Yeah, yeah. So we, do we need people to do it publicly? Yes, because we need to normalize it. Because we like it or not, people leave every single religion. Mm-hmm. Okay? And this obsession of Muslims, oh, Muslims need to calm down a bit. Mm-hmm. But I wouldn't put any individual in, the painful, in a painful situation because we need it to be, you know, because we need the representation. Yeah, you, yeah. So it depends yeah, on the yeah. person. I think in the beginning of my journey, I was very much like, you know, you absolutely have to do what's right for you and leaving Islam publicly is quite a scary thing, etc. But, you know, with time and seeing lots of stories of people who told their families and things, often being public, and by public, I don't mean necessarily like on YouTube, but I mean even with your family coming out, let's call it, is safer in the long term because you've created that boundary. And you've kind of said, this is where I am. Mm -hmm. Because otherwise, when people are kind of doing it, you know, piecemeal, often, I'll give you an example. They they might have a romantic partner. They they will have have kids. If they don't want to circumcise the child, they have to go through that journey. You just end up constantly fighting the fact that you're actually not Muslim. Mm -hmm. And I think that's uh, often been a challenge for people. But the challenge, you know, the difficulty of coming out publicly as an an ex-Muslim is also extremely difficult, particularly with family. And, you know, there's a lot of violence and stories like that as well, so... Um, I want to end it there uh, and start with some questions. Thank you both uh, for that a fascinating discussion. Uh, okay, so we do have so some questions have been submitted uh, ahead of time via Slido. So I'd like to prioritize those first, uh, but you can still submit questions uh, during the rest of the discussion. Um, um, so the question is, how can feminism and Islam align uh, given the abuses and, tr- um, and treatment of women in Islam, for example, regarding FGM? and the morality police, I guess also uh, hijabic restrictions, uh, especially in the context of what's happening in Iran right now, I think that could be very, very topical. And uh, could they not only coexist if there's serious reform in Islam? And that's also another theme. So does Islam need a reformation um, 
to have the modern sort of LGBT uh, friendly and feminist friendly aspects to them? Um, or can it, can it can those coexist without a reformation? Okay, it? the question is so deep and so you know multifaceted that we need an entire lecture for that. To begin with, Islamic feminism uh, exists and exists since 1990s. Fatima Mernissi, Amina Wadud, I can give you many names of females, uh, Muslim women, that they wrote books about that. Uh, what happens now is that social media disseminate these ideas and these perspectives. Now, when we talk about the reformation in Islam, there is a, a tiny, huge problem there. There is no such thing as one Islam. You can reform something if it is one. I can change the shape. But when we have Shia Islam, Sunni Islam, Wahhab Islam, Deoband Islam, Salaf Islam. Uh, uh, so perhaps each of them need to reform in their own ways. No, what, to happens, ha what happens is that those of us that we, um, how can I say, affiliate ourselves or we consider ourselves to be feminist Muslims, we uh, uh, um, present a different reading of the Quran where, and also we go into all these restrictions and we prove to the world why these restrictions are not good made, are human made. Why males of medieval era established them and why we, we deny to conform, to conform with them and we, we don't want them to happen anymore. But it's up to every Muslim woman to accept and, and practice it or not. And many Muslim women don't want to. But uh, Sophia, wouldn't you say Muhammad is also a medieval Muslim male? <laughs> But he, the, the, for his time, yes, he was. But for his time and through the Hadith, although personally, I mean, progressive Muslims and, and, and feminist Muslims, we focus primarily on the source, which is the Quran. Mm. We don't worship the Muhammad, the Prophet. We worship Allah. So this is one distinction that people need to understand that Hadith, as you said, many Hadith deify the companions and deify mm. the Prophet, which I personally feel very upset when people say that in front of me. Mm -hmm. So first of all is the Quran. We have to follow what God said. And also the Prophet himself, he was exceptionally feminist for his time being, okay? How, uh, give me an example of that. So imagine having the Prophet who was a spiritual leader and a political leader, and then women w went to the Prophet and was like, you know Prophet, why the, the Quran when it's being revealed is always revealed for the males, yeah, because yeah, what there's yeah, in the males. Yeah. The Prophet didn't fight back, didn't say anything, he didn't say, you woman, go away. He, the next, in the next revelation, the, the Quran came with believing women and believing men. And also, there is this hadith where a very beautiful woman, uncovered woman without hijab, she, was, she stopped the Prophet in the street and she was talking to him, and the Prophet was with a companion. And the companion was like uh, visibly impressed by her beauty. The Prophet noticed it, he didn't say to the woman, cover. He didn't say to the woman, woman, go to the house. He just did that on, on the companion. These are lessons that we can draw. What happens is that the, the, the I would say, oppressive understandings of Islam, they don't pay attention to these hadith. And we have so many hadith from Aisha that shows that the Prophet was, I mean, we have a hadith, I read it recently, where during their menses, when the, the Prophet's wives had their menses, the Prophet was asking them to go and put, you know, the, these gears to, uh, you know, stop the blood. Uh, and then he was cuddling and petting his wives. So, but what happens is that the traditionalist, or let's say the male, uh, um, okay, way of understanding Islam, more. they side, you know, they, they put on the side this hadith, they don't mention about them, and they take other hadith and they magnify them. I, I want to take a little bit of a, I want to just bring out what you said that Muhammad was more feminist for his time, because... For his time, huh? Sorry. Not for today, for his time. Which is interesting, because... For his time. Islam is supposed to be for all of man, for all of mankind, but anyway... Islam, the yeah. values and principles. So, so we'll, talk, we'll, talk about, we'll talk about that, because even within, so for example, the... the uh, if you look at um, some of the stories within Islam, mm -hmm. which treat the pre-Islamic, no, no, so for example, the pre-Islamic, the pre-Islamic tribes that were there, that you know there was a bit of a obviously there was a fight between uh, uh, Muhammad and the, and, the, and, the, and the people against, let's say, the Quraysh, the, the tribes, the polytheists, yeah. yeah, yeah. With the polytheists, if you actually look at what, so Khadija, who's one of the wives of the Prophet, who was who was from the polytheists, yes, 
When she was a non-Muslim, her she inherited the business. Yes, definitely. She ran the company. She definitely. hired Muhammad. Definitely. Dated I'm with her. I'm like, but but she, was, but she was an, she was a non-Muslim at the time. Definitely, so definitely. Aren't we aren't we seeing that actually this idea that Muhammad was progressive for his time is probably not true because we can look at polytheistic women even within Islamic tradition mm -hmm. and say, wait a minute. So, for example, there was a Hind who ate went to the battlefield and ate a liver, like. Uh, you know, it was, I think I can't remember who was, who was liver, but I think it's Hamza's liver. <laughs> we don't need that. If you go further back, it's the same. Yes. So if you go back to the Sasanian Empire, mm -hmm. women had a very, very strong role, and this is well pre-Islamic empire. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I would just posit that academically speaking, yes, it doesn't look like Muhammad was that much more progressive for his time. He was a man of the time. Okay, we can accept it like that, but at the same time, you talk about Khadija. Khadija was a wealthy woman. She was coming from the highest stratification yeah. of uh, yeah, the full community. Yeah, okay. yeah. It's like if you, you compare now uh, the way uh, women, or let's say the way the royal women of, of, of Jordan, let's say princesses and queen of Jordan live, with the way the, the Bedouin girls But Aisha live. was the, prophet, the wife of the prophet. She was also She became class. later. She became later. But, she was and, Abu, and no, but, she, but her, her dad, Abu Bakr, is one of the richest people in, 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 in the area. Aisha, so she, we're Aisha. talking about Khadija, not no, Aisha. no, but I'm saying because uh, you mentioned Aisha, the wife of the Prophet, as an example of like. No, 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 Khadija. I'm talking about Khadija. If I said Aisha, I'm sorry. No, but in I'm the an... previous example you gave, you said Aisha did a lot of hadith. Yes. And she was treated well as a as a wife of the Prophet. Of course, right? of course. But she was upper class as well. Exactly, exactly, exactly. So, so what I want to say is that. Uh, um, if you take the, the sum of the wives, because he was married also to slaves, okay? But uh, doesn't mean that because uh, Khadija was powerful, because she was, so because the highest level of, of, of in, the, in the community, the, le the women had power, doesn't mean that every woman had the power. And the life of the women that they were in the lower stratifications, it was horrible. Mm. For example, the idea that men were, I mean, the Quran permits men to marry up to four women but puts the condition that makes it impossible because God says in the Quran that, but this, you will never be just. So don't do it. Uh, but that's, that's, not what ha that's not ever been practiced in that way. Like, I mean, there was, exactly. And here we have was, the there was companions that would marry and divorce, marry and divorce, marry and divorce. And marry yeah, and yeah, divorce. you can marry. Look, this is, a, this is a Christian point of view. And I say that because I grew up as a Christian. Mm. For me, marriage was like, oh, I'm married for the rest of my life. That's it. Mm. In Islam, that's not the case. In Islam, you can marry and divorce as many times as you wish. So the idea of marriage, like the idea of, of religion, is totally different here than what it is in Islam. Mm. But back to the idea that, oh, the prophet was not a, a feminist. For his time, he was. Uh, and we don't see that only through the way he treated his wives, but also when he was being met and uh, argued against by, um, you know, lay what is, Muslim is it, Sorry, is Sophia, could, could I just lick that to the point of the, of the question where, it, regardless of whether we believe the prophet was a perfect or, or a, a perfect role model or, and or feminist and progressive for his time, mm. can his actions and teachings be, be taken directly and apply to 2022? His actions or, and teachings. Or, or do they have to be taken sort of symbolically? They don't have to be taken at all. We don't, uh, Muslims need Muslims to understand. Muslims shouldn't follow the Prophet? So. Uh, the stories of the Prophet are good as, as ethical paradigms. As, as parables. But not, yes, so but not, not yeah. as, not only symbolic, it's good to understand what was happening. What is the ethical then. content of yes. it, rather than the direct but action? The, the yeah. way we are supposed to, because Islam is the, the way that, personally, I find to connect with the Divine. Mm -hmm. My connection with the Divine is through the Quran. Yes. Not through the Prophet. Right. Okay? So <laughs> when it, when the questioner is asking about say FGM uh, or you know hijabi restrictions and and so forth, you're saying that Islam, your understanding of Islam as it exists currently, can be practiced with a compatibility for Western liberal values. Oh, definitely, values. absolutely, definitely. Yeah. The point is that the traditionalists feel very uncomfortable. About yeah. It. So I think when we talk about a reformation, what I'm asking is well, when I said before, you said there's different types of Islam. Well, each of the different groups in their own mind individually, but also in the leaders of those communities, should they look to prioritize this more esoteric version of Islam rather than the exoteric, ritualistic, literal version of Islam? Because it seems to me that's the one that butts up against yes. universalism, modernism, liberalism most. They don't want yeah. to, they will not do it easily, but it's up to women and, 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 and people that they are oppressed by these mm. practices to not leave them a different option. Yes. And also it's up to take responsibility of our religion. Yes. As, as each one of us, because if all of us 
we we express what we believe or what we you know how we feel comfortable in Islam, then there will be no space for such oppression. And could I ask you a connected question? That another one from Slido uh, about uh, removing the hijab. So, mm -hmm. what reactions have you seen within Western communities, both of you, when women decide to remove their hijab, whether they leave Islam or not, but just the hijab as a symbol? Again, maybe in the context of Iran. You want to go? Okay. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I'm. This is a difficult question, because when the non-Muslims see a woman removing the hijab, okay, let's take it the other way. Hijab is a question that I have said it in my videos. I'm, I'm absolutely bored and, and, and tired of talking about this piece of cloth. This is a piece of cloth. Okay. It's the most visible symbol for the person and, on the street. And yeah. we women, we have to carry the responsibility of being perfect in public because we are visible, Muslims and all that. We have so many more problems than the hijab. Mm -hmm. But when the non-Muslims see the women removing the hijab, is 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 another way for them to express Islamophobic uh, uh, mm -hmm. ideas. And also Muslims, as we see in Iran, Muslims are, are also angry at Muslim women for removing the hijab. Yes, because that threatens uh, Muslim men. Uh, yeah, Muslim men. Yeah, Muslim men. Because and also threatens... maybe Many Muslim women are also part of the morality police. Some of them, yes, mm -hmm. but you need to understand that it's whatever we I mentioned earlier that yeah. religion is in their blood, and they have themselves, they have shame. A patriarchal kind of thing within they themselves. Have, did yeah. you know? Even I mean, I grew up. I grew up. Uh, Greece is an exceptionally patriarchal society, mm -hmm. uh, religion aside. Okay, my mother, God bless her soul, she's dead now. She used to drink heavily and smoke heavily, and she used to say, actually, I am a man in a woman's body. <laughs> because that's what made her feel that she has value, because being a woman in a woman's body meant being devalued. So these women that they adhere to these ideas, it's their only way of being, feeling, f feeling that they are okay. Yes. Oh, yeah. can, I, uh, can I just, uh, yes. just also reflect something back on that? And I, I, I totally take the point about the hijab being boring in, in some ways for you because and and like I, this is why like for me because i'm quite interested in your academic background is like theologically here i will just say if i don't say this i'll probably get shouted at um people who have had to wear the hijab since puberty yes. probably have a very different experience so, because what you said mm. who had to yeah. wear the hijab yeah they didn't choose and another uh, topic that it's very important and we never talk about within the muslim community is that a born muslim did not choose to be a muslim i completely agree it uh, is supposed yeah. that upon puberty each individual is to choose his own religion and whether he will be or she will be in Islam. But how many born Muslims are being yeah, given yeah. this opportunity? I, I often, uh, if, I, if I talk to Muslims about kind of, you know, if Muslims are trying to like debate me or something and I'm not really interested in it, but one thing I'll say to them is, why are you Muslim? And they always say, I chose this, I did this and that. Did like, you? <laughs> not true, because if you were born in a Hindu background, 99.9% .9 of the time you'd be Hindu and you'd say the same thing to me. You'd be like, oh, yes. it's the amazing Hindu theology, of etc." And I think people often miss that. Like, uh, And I often say to Muslims, and this is something that's a trick that kind of works if anyone in the audience wants to have a discussion with someone who's quite sort of anti leaving people who leave Islam, is I say, great, leave Islam for a week. Just do it publicly for one week. If, 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 if someone believes that it's hot, it, well, why are you talking about it? Why are you talking about leaving Islam? Do it for a week. See what happens. And that always shuts people up because they, they know. Internally, they know what it means. And it's probably the same with hijab. Like if you say to someone, oh, if you think this is not that, you know, that, that difficult, take it off because everyone's going to have a discussion about you then. Right? Mm -hmm. and, and, and like, you know, you can look at celebrities. Um, there's a, a makeup artist, uh, blogger, uh, Dina Tokyo, who took it off. And... She almost lost her career out of mm -hmm. that, you know, because she was a hijab wearing person and took it off. Um, yeah. Should we? The question says, you've mentioned Islam is Arab imperialism. Uh, what about a certain verse, uh, chapter 9, uh, 97 of the Quran? Uh, For most of Islamic history, Muslim Arabs were ruled by non-Arabs, especially Turks. I think... More of an, uh, again, academic historical yeah, point there. Yeah, I don't want to get, wanna get too much into it, but the flavor I, I of the think, questions. As, as Sophia said, like, Islam for a long period of time was political, right? And and I think that it, while that's true, when the foundation, I mean, it's probably also true about various empires. The Very few empires are really pure in, in, in sort of, they often draw on traditions. The Roman Empire went to Byzantine, and Byzantine is not Rome, uh, and it was much broader than just Rome, right? So I think Islamic... Islam also did the same thing. It was an empire across a lot of the world. And um, 
but the, 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 the foundational theology was Arabic. Uh, Arabic was the language of heaven. Arabic was the language that you really, if you wanted to understand God's word, you have to, uh, you know, practice. People were learning the Quranic Arabic even without knowing the language, which I agree is not a good thing, but it is the way that Quran was spread. It was supposed to be one of the miracles of the Quran. Um, then you look at today where you've got most of the world does, uh, who are Muslims do not speak Arabic. And for me, it comes across as a very imperialist force. And I don't make it a special thing. I don't say, oh, Islam is so bad. Because I think all imperialist forces are very similar. I, I say the same thing about the British Empire that used to be, and it's, it's, it's focused now. I just think Islam is not special in that way. Islam is also an imperialist force to me. Uh, I don't know if you have a... I want to make a, one correction. A, Islam was never one empire. We had very different uh, yeah, caliphates, yeah, yeah, yeah. okay? And we had Persians, yes. and we had uh, uh, Shia yeah, uh, yeah. caliphates. And yes, uh, Arabic was supposed to be the religion, the language of the religion, but the language of the, of the uh, you know, public, uh, the, the civil service and all, and all the army was not when Arabic. Local, yeah, no, no, yeah. no, 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 it was Israel. The, the, the common point but it was, was about that. But it, it's, it's actually the Arabic. Of, yes, it actually reminds me of uh, Zoroastrian uh, faith where the administrators were Zoroastrian, they spoke Persian, but the people they took over didn't even speak that language. They were sort of, they were, they but were they maintained, the But they maintained the language of the civil service, let's say, or the public. It maintained, it, was, it did not become Arabic. Uh, you need to understand that much of the information and understanding we have about Islam and Islamic history today comes from the last two centuries, 200 years, where Wahhabi and Salafi Islam has mm. spread around. And uh, yes, of course, Wahhabi and Salafi, they spread the idea that, oh, Arab is an Arabic and everything, but mm. it wasn't that clear. It's, it's, Islamic history is much more complicated. Mm. Uh, one of the questions here is, uh, if you uh, could both choose, uh, what was the, so for, for Sophia, what's the best uh, aspect of Islamic philosophy for you uh, that, all, that you found it offers? And for Imtiaz, what, similarly, what's the best thing about a humanistic or atheistic worldview you, that you feel has help, helped you leave Islam or was a, was a comfort or was a resource to you in your journey? Super long one. Very strong. Yeah. Um, how? I was impressed and I was very angry why we don't have these principles in Sharia. Surah Al-Baqarah primarily tells people not to lie, not to lie to each other and not to corrupt. And this is one of the most beautiful and one of the values and the principles that resonates with me because imagine a world where everyone will be honest, nobody will harm, and we will be kind to each other. I mean, this uh, is not philosophy, it's from the Quran. Mm -hmm. yes. um, you know, it's interesting, like, there's, there's concepts within Islam that definitely resonate in that way to me as well. Like, you know, there's certain things you grow up with, habits and things. I often then, when I did a bit of digging, I often was like, oh, it actually has a longer history than Islam maybe in some cases. And you would argue it's probably Christianity. But, you know, there's certain concepts we take from areas. I think for me with, with humanism, what I really liked, I mean, actually, like a lot of humanists, I was humanist without realizing I was a humanist for a long time. So for me, it was just the idea that, oh, everyone can be wrong and Everyone can have a discussion about it in a way that ideally, and not every humanist does that, I definitely am not always doing that, where you can be like, ah, wait, you said something that actually just completely changed my worldview. And I really like that about humanism. Um, I also like that there's no God in the set, and I don't mean God just in the spiritual way. I mean, there's nothing that's considered immutable. And I love that. Like, you can go into science, because mm -hmm. science is the same thing. We're constantly finding out there's no immutability in, in, in physics. And I, I just love that lack of immutability because with my tradition of growing Islam, there's lots of immutables, like the Word of God, Muhammad, da, 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 which I, I know it depends on which mm -hmm. tradition you're in, but but um, then moving from that to zero immutability, including the Quran, is like a wild, you know. It's scary as well, of course. You, you know, say, I'll scary. tell you something. When you said that there is no God, my heart trembled. And it's not rational, it's emotional. No, course, I mean, yeah. as a human, I think that personally, I need to have this higher authority. I thought that as well for a lot God. of time. Yeah. I had 20 years of feeling that as well. I mean, you know what's really interesting when you speak to elderly people who are who left Islam late in life? Yes. That's fascinating. There's a guy I know who's 79 years old. He would like do dawah and he was preaching and things like that. And he left Islam. He's a vegan now. And uh, that's his like philosophical journey. And he's 
got so much joy. And I used to think, I, like, I, I completely you get it. You needed to that, yeah. I get it. But mm -hmm. when you start meeting people who go on that journey and come out the other end, it's, it's fascinating. Mm. People find joy mm. everywhere. And, oh, yes. and people, you know, there is a risk of things like nihilism and things like that being negative for you. I'm, I'm a bit nihilistic, but, but I think that's true even if you're Muslim anyways. Islam doesn't give everyone happiness either. It kind of depends on where you find yourself there. Right? Is, is there a particular resource that looking back you wish that you'd had MTS when you took that initial oh, step? Oh, just someone who would tell me that I can leave Islam. If someone just told me that, I'd be like, all right, I'll do the rest of the work myself. So we've already, as an apostate community or ex-Muslim community, come a long way and given that oh, resource we're so, to... Yeah, we're so far ahead now. Yeah. Uh, and, mm. and just the fact that we're having this conversation, like there's nothing like this on the internet, by the way, like really nothing, especially someone who converted and someone who left. I, I've never seen anything like it. So the more we can do things like that, the better. <laughs> and find it from, uh, from like and subscribe side. to your channel da, 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 da. <laughs> yeah. but let me tell you I will and I knew that the moment you uh, you, you approached me I, I can tell you for sure that I will be called uh, uh, infidel and yeah, I will be yeah. called that I am yeah. a fake Muslim and yeah, whatever yeah. because I'm here and because I am respectful and you know yeah 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 you I should be trying to murder me, and I should oh. be trying to do something. And what is it that I should be doing? I should be saying, Look, do you know, do you I should be, do you I should be Islamophobic. I should That's going to be for the after hours portion <laughs> of the evening. Please. Cameras you guys that missed version. that? She said, I should be, you know how difficult it is to take blood out of white clothes. <laughs> well, I'm a woman, I know how to be. So the comment there is, the question is, what are the differences between people that leave Islam for another religion and go to atheism? One of the points you made earlier, like right at the beginning was, you know, in your journey to Islam, some of it was life experience, some of it was like things you learned. Let's say all of these things did happen and it's, it's, the Quran is the word of God and things like that. I can't really prove it, if that makes sense. And, and proof is a problem for me. Uh, not for me, because faith is what I choose to believe. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It doesn't have to resonate. And yeah. one of the greatest um, difficulties I have personally is that my academic approach to Islam is mm. totally different than my personal. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. academically, for example, I know I'm convinced that God has not required, uh, requested mm. us to wear mm. hijab. Mm. But I like it. My yeah. soul likes it. Yeah. Sometimes friends tell me that, look, maybe your soul shows you the right path. I said, yeah, if this is, it's mm. for me. It's not mm. for everyone. Don't you feel like human, the human experience is so wrong so often? Like we were so biased that some of these... I'll give you an example. I remember being in Mecca, the holy sort of site for Muslims, and it was Laylatul Qadr, which is like the holiest night. And it hadn't rained for 10 years, and it started raining, and everyone was like, hallelujah, you know, like, not hallelujah, but you get the point. <laughs> <laughs> you know, everyone was crying. Alhamdulillah. Yeah, alhamdulillah. People were crying, I was crying, it was like wild. It was so, like, so wild. And, and that was a spiritual experience for me. That was, whoa, like, whoa. But that was just an experience for me. Like, I know what I felt, and I can see other people feel that about other religions, and I can see people feel it even if they're atheists. You know, I, I, sometimes people talk about the birth of their child and how that felt, whoa. They're spiritual but not religious. Yeah, so, so I kind of, don't you feel that it's a bit difficult, complicated to base your foundation of faith on experience in that way? No, personally, you're asking me personally. Yeah, 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 personally. No, and again, when I was talking about my experiences in life, I didn't mean uh, spiritual experience. Mm. I meant, you know, knowing people that they drink heavily yeah, yeah, and they and beat their wife. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. when the Quran says don't, you know, avoid the, the intoxicants, mm. there is good in them, but there's also more sure, bad. Sure. I'm with them. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, I mean, I'm someone that in my first marriage from a Christian husband, I was heavily physically abused and I was in the hospital every month mm. because my husband was alcoholic mm. so come and tell me that the Quranic uh, that, that I will not be like alhamdulillah because if in my community when in my community I was saying that look he's drinking everyone's like but everyone is drinking yeah yeah, yeah. you yeah, see yeah. so mm. I didn't mean spiritual this is, this is one of the reasons I don't really like alcohol in general yes it's yes yes yeah. But for me, no, it's, it's absolutely, I mean, I'm happy and this is something I, I, I cannot, when people ask, ask me too much about Islam, I tell them that I cannot explain to you why I converted in a rational manner. Mm. For me, it was my heart. It was where my heart took me. And I'm happy with that. Sure, sure, sure. sure. Thank you. So, so the question, just to summarize the question is, uh, so you want more 
although the speakers did start, the first thing they said was their own personal stories of how they left Islam. And we said resources of why people leave Islam as well. But you, you want some more clarification on uh, the different reasons that people leave Islam and maybe like the top two reasons, or is no, it, for I, example, the commentary, the Hadith, no. or is it, for example, the Quranic problems with, was it actually a book written by God and if so I, forth? If I can, yeah, when I was thinking about the way to take this conversation because of Sophia's background, I thought it was more interesting to kind of flirt with it rather than go too heavy. Um, but I think uh, you have to be careful because every time you have a question, there's always something that someone will say to answer it. It's, and at some point, it's not enough for you. So to give you an example, this concept that hadith was written later, what, what a lot of Muslims will say yes, because the oral tradition is a is, is the way that it was carried out and in fact the Quran was also oral tradition but you had the concept of mutawatir so it's like you know a immutable almost it's almost immutable thread of, of, of narrators but then you go into that and it's like and you can just go into that forever so I think one of the important things is like I, a, a bit like we were saying earlier first is why are you Muslim you're Muslim because you're born into it or you converted and there was a reason for that etc etc start there then go all right clear head if I was starting this from scratch, would I really believe this stuff? Start. That's what I did, and that was a danger. <laughs> because I, I tried to do it to become more Muslim, not less. I was like, all right, this is clearly too much like crap, let's say, from the community. Um, let me approach this as systematically as I can. And that's a terrible idea for me, because then you start to do that. And again, individual things you, you could always find responses to, but you add it all up, and it just looks like any other religion. And another thing I would say is learn about other religions. We often don't do that enough in Islam. Specifically, what was useful for me is to go beyond um, biblical and stuff because the problem is Islam is syncretic, right? So you're in that area. I would go Mormons, right? Look at the conversations ex-Mormons and Mormons have and be like, wait a minute, this is exactly the same conversations. I remember telling my aunt this once about some of the, the, the miracles of prophecy in Mormonism. And she was like, yeah, of course, because it's all Islam. You know, like Islam came. I was like, ah, but Mormonism came hundreds and hundreds of years after Islam. So you start just going broader than that Islamic tradition and that conversation we're having, constantly the debates we're having. That's the circle. Go a bit beyond that, go into academia. I mean, this is why I, I love having this conversation with Sophia, because she's an academic. So we can have certain types of conversations you don't really learn as a traditional, in a traditional like upbringing. Um, going beyond Islam even, and you know, and Mormonism, etc., etc. Meet other apostates. That was really useful for me because it helps you deal with your psychological stuff as you're going through this journey. Um, and just really, really quickly, like for me personally, is uh, the, the Hadith was a big problem. But if you remove the Hadith, which I did for three solid months and just focus on Quran, then I'm like, well, first of all, the method of transmutation of the Quran was very similar to Hadith. It's just mutawatir, it's just the mother essentially. And there's a lot of complicated academic stuff about whether the Quran was actually done in any immutable way as well. It just got too complicated for me in that sense. Then there was morality. Uh, you know, I think you can have a, I would argue, a better morality if you get rid of the Quran and you just focus on kind of your own, you know, philosophy and things like that versus constantly being stuck to old stuff. But that was just me. Um, so I hope that kind of gives you a little bit of a taste. Maybe we can have a chat later. Yeah, maybe the yeah, question you're asking is how do people leave Islam, which is a slightly different question than yeah, why yeah. do people leave Islam. But I'd be happy to chat yeah. to you one-to-one. -one. Uh, yeah, uh, last question there at the back. So how does being an ex-Muslim relate to being a secular Muslim? And is a secular Muslim maybe a softening of the position? And then also how does MTS relate to being a cultural Muslim? I want to challenge the idea that it's linear. So I think a lot of ex-Muslims do the same thing where we talk about um, Salafi, Progressive, liberal, secular, ex-Muslim. I don't think these things are linear because you can meet ex-Muslims who are like far right. You can ex-Muslims who are far left. Secularism is a completely separate concept to me than whether you're Muslim or not, because you can't, uh, like, you know, as the Turks have shown, you can be secular and Muslim and Bangladeshi, etc. cetera. Um, I personally love people from, from various Muslim backgrounds who are every sort of person, because I think that reflects my understanding of the fluidity of Islamic theology as well. And the reality is Islam is made by humans, in my mind. Therefore, there will be every flavor of Islam because there's every flavor of Muslim. So I'm a little bit controversial, I think, compared to a lot of ex-Muslims who think that reform is probably impossible because I think Islam is man-made. Uh, just on cultural Muslim, I do call myself that sometimes. 
my reasoning for this, and I get a lot of shit from some ex-Muslims on this, is because I did not grow up with Bangladeshi and Pakistani culture properly. Actually, my background is very Islamic. And so I don't have too many cultural constructs I can relate to. Like Eid is the time in my family, you know? Um, Makkah was something we did twice a year. I still have mem happy memories of that, you know? Uh, masjids are complicated, mosques are complicated because they're both places of spiritual connection and community, but also there's where all the, some of the bad shit happens, you know? So, but I do say I'm cultural Muslim, and it means that I go and eat during Ramadan and don't fast. Or I'll, 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 I'll intermittent fast sometimes just because I want to, and I'll drink water as much as I want. It's whatever I want to make it, and that works really well for me. And uh, I don't know how, maybe if you're an ex-Muslim, how you relate to that, but that's where it works for me. Yeah. I don't know, what about you? And you're within the Islamic kind of tradition, I would say, well, Islamic. Uh, you know, how do you... For me, it's the opposite, because yeah. I didn't grow up with an yeah. Islamic background. Yeah. So, uh, so what, where does your culture come from? Is it Greek? Greek. Yeah. Um, I, I was there until did I was 32. You, did you pick anything from Islam that maybe relate to like certain types of cultural aspects that work for you? Like, I mean, I guess Eid, maybe. Mm, not the really. Food. <laughs> not really. No, 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 not really. Uh, I was not eating pork even before I converted. Yes, pork it's, was it's a, terrible. a, a, a weird worse. thing. Yeah. No, I can't say that. The, yes, point, is, the point is that in, in, in my household, I celebrate Christmas and I celebrate Easter because of my daughters and sister. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't celebrate Eid because I'm alone. So the whole idea of Islam is community. The whole concept is community, being communal. If you don't have the community, and I don't have the community, mm. yeah, for me it's another Tuesday. I mean, it's uh, okay. You have know? you spoken to the Inclusive Mosque Initiative? I'm I have been there, yeah, yeah. They're pretty cool. Know. They're pretty cool. They are, they're they are, they're yeah, they're yeah, yeah. And thank you for being so patient with us and sharing your views. Sorry if we didn't get to your questions, but the good news is the conversation continues at the Enterprise Pub. Uh, and if you don't know the way there, there'll be people from CLH who can guide you. It's on Red Lion Street. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very fight. much, everyone. Now we can fight. <laughs> <laughs> to the death. Boot. <laughs>